Dear colleagues and friends, uh, thank you, thank you for being here for the panel 1A, and of course, welcome. Uh, my name is Jacques Serre, and uh, I was seriously speaking. I'm head of design of Safran and Craft Engine and sometimes vice president engineering. The, the subject of uh, this, uh, this panel is, of course, new trends in, in airworthiness. And uh, to discuss uh, that subject, which is very important, uh, we will have uh, five panelists, <laughs> and uh, I get them Introduce themselves. Good afternoon. My name is Zhu Xuefeng. I'm the director, uh, director, assistant of aircraft certification develop, uh, division of CAC. It is my pleasure to be here to, uh, today. Ludovic Aron. Um, I'm uh, the acting head of large airplanes department at uh, EASA. Uh, Good afternoon, my ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yang Jun. I'm the man manager of airworthiness department of Comac. My job is on the airworthiness and quality uh, control. Didier Robin, uh, deputy head of airworthiness at uh, Airbus. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Belinda Swain. I'm the head of airworthiness at Rolls Royce. So when we prepare the, the session with, uh, with the panelists, uh, one of the questions is, why do we have to, to move? What are our concerns? And we have tried in some charts to, to put some, uh, some ideas. First, of course, you, it's an evidence to say that the world of uh, aviation is moving very fast. You can see on the chart some data from the International Civil Aviation Organization, which shows that uh, uh, the number of passengers will reach, has reached uh, in 2016, uh, 3.7 billion, with uh, an increase of 6%. You can see also the number of departures, which is uh, quite, uh, quite important, with uh, 35 million uh, of passengers and uh, uh, globally a huge increase also in the revenue passenger kilometers of about 6.3 percent but these are data which are rather average data and uh, what really happens when you are in charge of a product i have put some some data i i know very well these are the, the data from the uh, CFM 56 engines, but I think the, the same trends will be shown on A320 or will be seen tomorrow in uh, C919 uh, when it will be uh, in service. You, you can see that the slope is tremendous and that the, the number of cumulative hours uh, will very rapidly reach in that example uh, 1 million. At the same time, the variety of traffic is also increasing. We have, all, of course, uh, larger plane, but perhaps we will have tomorrow unmanned aircraft, balloons, huge balloons, perhaps, in addition. So with, uh, with a huge increase of the, of the traffic, you, we will have to collect more data, we will have more events, to detect, to analyze, more corrective action to implement, more resources to be dedicated to support the fleet. And the question is, are our rules and methods still valid for tomorrow fleet? And really, uh, we can say that the pace is accelerating. Uh, at the same time, 
the globalization of aviation sector is increasing. That means more applicants, more authorities, more projects, uh, and of course, people working uh, on same or different product with different cultures, and of course, it will increase the risk of human error. You can see also that at the same time, uh, new technologies are emerging. Most of them are introduced to increase safety. Uh, for, for example, increase connectivity, uh, new materials, flexible cabin uh, arrangement, and corresponding threats, for example, uh, possible cyber attack. So the question is, how will we adapt? We, we, have, we have discussed together, and some possible answers are, are given on that chart. International cooperation, regulation harmonization, increase of cooperation between authorities and manufacturers, change the approach to certification with, for example, more involvement of manufacturers in aerosinous certification. So this is, this is the subject of, uh, of our panel, and uh, we, are, we are going to, to discuss of this concept with, uh, with our panelists. Mr. Ju Schwefen, you, you are an actor of uh, the aircraft certification at CAAC. You are, of course, familiar with uh, international cooperation. Uh, could you explain us all the needs and benefits of uh, international cooperation and regulation harmonization between the different authorities? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Moderator. During our discussion in the morning, the authorities and industrial participants talked a lot during their speeches about the international cooperation and the importance of the international co cooperation, in including the benefits of BASA. I will not uh, go into detail in this uh, in this regard. I'm going to talk about what I witnessed in my work in terms of international cooperation, the way and modes of our international cooperation. Aviation is the bridge that connects the world. Indeed, aviation has internationalization as the feature hardwired in it. Last year, registered aircraft reached, for transport aircraft, reached 3,017 uh, units, an addition, annual addition of more than 300. Most of them were imported aircrafts. The import of aircrafts needs authorities, uh, including the imported country uh, authority and export country export uh, authority, needs uh, collaboration and exchange in terms of validation and acceptance of these products. When validating and accepting imported aircrafts, which are the additional conditions, this is very important to the acceptance and validation work, and also which products there are available, and also when products are delivered into China, how uh, which uh, materials and files we need to get prepared. All these things, detailed work needs international collaboration. And in order to make sh uh, to ensure the sustained uh, safety, uh, together with in export country authorities, we need to work on a sustained uh, airworthiness and uh, technical assistance. Now, if this product needs to be repaired and maintained in our country, or it needs to undergo sophisticated uh, process of treatment and also technical assistance from exported countries. The uh, technical assistance is very important. These are above uh, the traditional conventional uh, reasons why uh, international collaboration is very important between export countries and import countries. With the pace of globalization, we've realized that uh, in recent years, we've got new modes and ways of collaboration that are, uh, requires us to come up with new uh, method and m new ways of collaboration, first in terms of the design of the products, 
we have two companies from two countries to co-invest and co-design and co-validate uh, the products in order to uh, facilitate uh, the product and in order to facilitate uh, manufacturing and avoid du duplication. We collaborated uh, a great deal uh, with overseas country and authorities. So I think it is very important for authorities to collaborate with each other. So in the future, we will be able to find new areas for collaboration. Another trend is that more and more um, imported uh, products are manufactured in China, but some, uh, but the license is still in the possession of export countries. But in China, we need the manufacturing license. Thus, there is a gap between the between them the between them and. In order to solve this issue, we need the collaboration between authorities of two sides uh, to facilitate the, uh, the coordination of um, the manufacturing design and also and uh, airworthiness certification and validation. Above is so far the mode and methods of collaboration between the two authorities of the two sides. In terms of the collaboration of regulations, now first of all, this is very important. The regulation harmonization is very important for the collaboration between authorities because in this process, you we first of all need to see and is there any difference in the procedure of airworthiness so that uh, this can smooth smoothen the uh, collaboration onward. Of course, it is natural that we have differences. Yet, if we we have harmonized regulations, if we are on the same page all the time, then this is good for the um, exchange of products and for the collaboration. So in order to further enhance effectiveness and efficiency, we need the harmonization of regulations. This is very important for our co collaboration of the two sides. And also, uh, it is very important for the airworthiness agreement. We this morning talked about the BATA, uh, BASA. Then, in the agreement, one of the important uh, topic is to compare the regulations of the two sides to spot the differences. And is it okay for the uh, re uh, for these differences for the gap to exist? And how do we uh, cope with this in the future? Now, if we can coordinate on this regard, then this is very helpful for us to reach a agreement uh, because in this way the comparison work is much easier and it is more likely to be accepted by the two sides. Another coordination which is also very important but not directly linked to what I've been talking about but it's very important to the regulation harmonization. For example, when we're setting up our rules, perhaps we need to uh, refer to our counterparts in overseas uh, countries. Is there any best practice that we can borrow from them now, uh, so that uh, when we are drawing up our regulations, we'll be able to think about, uh, think comprehensively. And also, we may need to joint handedly uh, come up with the solutions to emerging issues. Uh, reg on regulation harmonization in recent years, we've been to many international occasions, meetings, conferences, and one of one of which is the uh, the regulation revision. And in this regard, is uh, ACO and authorities invited uh, the avi Civil Aviation um, Association of many countries. And with the joint input, it is very good for the development, especially for the, sm uh, sm for the small size um, aircrafts. So I think regulation harmonization is very important, important for the industrial development and for the airworthiness certification as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chu. Thank you very much.
the the design assurance system we we know in terms of airworthiness is really the the, the basic and uh, it's important sometimes to come back to basic uh, mr uh, uh, yanchen you are general manager at airworthiness management department uh, at comac airworthiness management of course has no secret for you can you explain us the principle of design insurance at, at, uh, at Comac, please? Uh, Thank you, moderator. Let me very briefly introduce you our uh, within a system uh, in our company and some insurance system. Well, we have a big system to ensure uh, from design, employees, insurance of design. Of course, uh, um, the design of insurance is um, the most important part. When we set up uh, the design uh, insurance system, we rely on two uh, standards. First one is uh, CAC uh, compulsory standard uh, according to CAC standard and criteria. Um, they are very um, clarified uh, standard and criteria to meet up uh, in terms of validation. And the second standard is about uh, our own company system because we want to um, realize our um, airworthiness. Uh, we have to carry out the design work uh, in full aspect of the first one. When we are designing, we have to carry out all the designing work according to the airworthiness criteria. The second insurance is to ensure that uh, our aircraft that we manufactured have to uh, meet the demands of airworthiness standard. The sixth, uh, third insurance is that well, our designing system should need uh, meet the need of airworthiness of international standard. The fourth uh, airworthiness insurance is that uh, we want to ensure uh, the um, aircraft in terms of uh, um, airworthiness in terms of market need. So uh, in terms of international um, authorities and the market, we work from all respect in order to meet the air, uh, airworthiness standard. So for OEMs and our authorities, we all have the demand to set up the design uh, validation or uh, airworthiness standard. The second part, second point I want to uh, talk about is um, um, the designing uh, insurance system in our company. In all uh, system, designing systems, we have three aspects of insurance. Uh, the first aspect is that we have to set up all the document. In this uh, set of uh, documents and files, it includes all the data, the bo uh, booklets, and the procedures. Currently, in our company, in terms of uh, AR, um, we are now uh, doing TC and CAC uh, validation, especially in terms of uh, AR, uh, we have already get the validation and certification from the authorities. And our own um, evaluation is that we can meet the demand, uh, demand of the standard of uh, the authority. The second aspect is the organization. Uh, the framework of organization is very important to ensure any uh, job actually. Um, in terms of uh, our company, we have uh, uh, different centers, for example, pilot uh, trial, um, designing system center. In every center uh, of our uh, divisions, we all set up uh, a particular staff or workforce to ensure uh, worthiness. So there is very clear organization and a framework. Uh, the third point 
is that we have the right persons to do this. In our company, we set up all the documentation and the files. We also uh, train and uh, our people, and we set up a particular staff uh, for task force. Um, so from the aspect of engineering, we have two groups of people. The first group uh, is aircraft uh, air weatherness management. The second group is uh, air weatherness engineering. And uh, the second group, we have uh, uh, the people, the right person to ensure the airworthiness in terms of engineering. So in terms of organization, we uh, have been undergone eight years of uh, trying and setting up. So currently, we have a relatively a kind of a matured system of organization and uh, staff. My third point is our future outlook to ensure airworthiness and safety. That is to say, uh, for our future trend to ensure um, the aircraftiness that we had mentioned this morning, our understanding is that for OEM manufacturers, it is important for uh, designers or cert certificate holders, procedure management is very important. And the most, actually, the most important way to ensure safety. We think that it is very important to set up the evaluation and acceptance uh, of our own uh, airworthiness system. A validation system. So this is our core understanding. Under this framework, then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our supporting uh, ideas or mechanisms. As we know, a CAC is now um, working uh, on uh, supporting uh, supporting the uh, insurance and val on validation of airworthiness and it's uh, revising some of the items is in its old documents and regulation i think it's very uh, good and it's very helpful to improve uh, the aircraft uh, industry in china and also in demand of uh, uh, the companies in the industry and the second a uh, small point uh, is that in AI uh, industry, we are now working on the research to um, carry out the uh, more e e efficiency um, organization to uh, make full play of the uh, safety system or insurance system. Um, so that uh, we do better self-evaluation and self-improvement. And then uh, all, all this uh, self-evaluation system could be recognized or accepted by the authorities. And with our efforts, we hope that we can lower the pressure of uh, like uh, uh, the right uh, personnel. For, uh, then for more type uh, projects, more uh, transport need could be uh, met. Um, the HR uh, pressure could be relieved uh, if we can do it uh, in a better way. For OEMs, uh, for companies like us, uh, we should have a higher requirement on ourselves. So based on uh, the regulations, um, the uh, certificate holders could, should be given more right to carry out their own uh, self-evaluation system. The third point I want to uh, mention is that uh, we, uh, improve, we improve our designing insurance system. We have to work in two um, uh, three aspects. Uh, the first one is that uh, uh, authority. The uh, uh, second point is the organization. And third is our own um, uh, monitoring system. Uh, of course, there are. it is not a matured system. Thank you for, for listening uh, of my introduction.
Thank you. Mr. Yang, for, for this uh, uh, description for design insurance and also the, the way you are cooperating with uh, your authority, CAEC, uh, in, uh, in design and certification. Um, this is this is some way of working and tomorrow perhaps we will uh, slightly uh, make a evolution on that and i see i know that uh, at iaza uh, the adoption of what is called a risk-based oversight rbo approach uh, this approach uh, aim to create a, a real partnership between uh, regulators and manufacturers. Mr. Ludovic Caron, you are acting as head of large airplane department at IASA. Can you say more about uh, this uh, new approach, RBO? Yes, uh, Mr. Sir, with pleasure. Um, first of all, I would like to come back to a bit to your introduction about the aviation growth how it translates into uh, more applicants, more projects, more authorities. And definitely it means for the authorities, CAC, for IASA, uh, higher workload. So the question is, the question we asked ourselves a few years ago is, um, we, can we afford having uh, an increase in our resource in a commensurate manner, commensurate to the uh, industry and aviation growth. And what we decided is first um, to address uh, the efficiency of our current um, system uh, for product certification and, and oversight. Um, Risk-based oversight is not new. Uh, it's uh, interesting, interesting to the EASA system. It has been there uh, since uh, the creation of IASA and the basic uh, principle, the paradigm is uh, industry, uh, the type certificate orders are primarily accountable uh, and responsible for safety. They're, the applicants are um, the one that have the exclusive uh, responsibility for uh, demonstrating uh, compliance to the applicable product certification basis. And of course, uh, the authority have their role to play in compliance verification. However, it is not exhaustive. The check is not exhaustive. And this is acceptable because it's compensating, compensated by um, an oversight of the uh, organization of the applicants. Um, of course, this requires, uh, as we just mentioned, as just Mr. Young had rest, uh, the uh, a safety assurance system uh, to be in place in the design organization. And of course, an oversight of this uh, assurance system by uh, the authority. So coming back to the point that um, the compliance checking of the authority is not exhaustive. The question that you might have is how do we choose the area and the depths of our involvement in compliance checking? And for sure, uh, we don't go for random sampling. This would be inefficient, this would be risky. So it's already the case, although quite implicit uh, in the way we work, that we are already applying risk-based approach when we decide of our where we involve ourselves in compliance checking and um, this risk-based approach is so far applied essentially at individual level we rely on our staff that is highly skilled and competent that has acquired experience through the exposure of certification project a lot of certification project we rely on them through also training of our staff, but it's still an individual determination of the area of involvement. And although the criteria for involvement are quite similar um, between the people, there is no mutualization 
of this experience. There are hardly uh, standardization of the approach. And that's what we've been working on, what we are aiming to implement starting from next year, is a more structured process uh, to this uh, determination of level of involvement. So on the chart, which is quite simplistic actually, but you know the, the best process are also the simple one. Um, this is just illustrating what we are aiming at. The, the level of involvement should be uh, commensurate and proportionate to the risk of non-compliance of the design. And we are targeting the green area, an acceptable level of safety, the one what we have always have, that we are continuously improving for sure. But basically, if there is a low risk of non-compliance, uh, there is no need to have a high involvement in that area. If we are having a high involvement, there is lower efficiency. On the contrary, where the risk of non-compliance is high, then we need to have a high involvement, a deep involvement. Otherwise, there is a risk that uh, there is the danger is that we don't mitigate properly the risk. So for that, the three pillars that are just in the equation on the screen here, the three pillars are um, the novelty and the complexity of the design, and on the other hand, the performance of the design organization. So very quickly, novelty is about innovation. Innovation in the design, new, te new technologies, but also novelties in the means of compliance, in the tools that we use to justify our design. Complexity is self-explanatory. Um, we highlighted also in the novelties and the, in the future trends, the higher level of integration of uh, the designs. And specifically, uh, this is a parameter of the complexity, high integrated airplanes, high integrated systems. Performance of the designs. This is the performance of the design organization is probably the most challenging one to uh, define and to implement. It's at the same time the performance of the organization and the justification of the design, the compliance demonstration, uh, but also, as we mentioned earlier, the capacity of a design organization to uh, implement um, a self-assessment, uh, uh, independent checking, and the performance of this system. So on the next slide, um, I would like to illustrate now this um, movement from the risk-based approach 1.0 to the risk-based approach 2.0. Um, here you have on the right side um, the product certification and on the left side the organization of a site. And you see that at the middle we have our risk model and uh, where we accumulate uh, the experience, uh, the, the feedback on these two, um, these two uh, process. One feeds the other. We accumulate experience in product certification on the product and we accumulate experience with an, an organization. Um, one cannot live with the other. We have a system, uh, these two loops, are living in a unity and in a harmony and uh, unable to have a balanced level of involvement and level of oversight. So the higher the oversight, the lower the involvement. The higher the involvement, the lower the oversight. And this is typically what we are trying to implement to have a, a more efficient process. So in conclusion, this, this is typically a quality-oriented evolution uh, of our risk-based approach, our risk-based oversight. It's in order to ensure uh, higher standardization, so a level playing field for all applicants. It's in order to enable also transparency, uh, which means also predictability. We mentioned that this morning has been very important for the industry to better plan 
Um, and uh, it also uh, enables us to reach higher efficiency, but also it should enable higher efficiency on the industry side. And finally, it requires more than ever safety culture to be implemented in the design organization. And safety culture is something more just than just culture. Um, it encompassing really implementing um, a, a, a safety awareness at every step, every level of an organization. And this is to enable also to build, con to, to build confidence between uh, the uh, industry and uh, the authority and uh, to establish uh, in the long haul a trustful partnership uh, between industry and authority. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you, you outlined during your, your presentation the importance of involvement of the manufacturers in the airworthiness certification process. This is of course not a, a new concept and Mrs. Belinda Swain, Swain you are head of uh, airworthiness at Rolls Royce. Can you, can you give us your, your opinion about uh, benefits or even drawback uh, of uh, level of involvement approach. Hey, hello, everybody. So uh, uh, Ludovic uh, told us from the uh, regulator's point of view uh, what's good about risk-based oversight and level of involvement. And, and now you're going to hear an industry view and see if uh, the two are aligned. So um, as I, I'm part of the uh, EASA uh, industry steering committee that's looking at the concept of level of involvement that is the involvement of the certifying authority in reviewing the technical details for certification programs so test wit witnessing technical review of documents what level should that be um, and as uh, as we've heard uh, there's a lot of benefit uh, from managing resources and indeed for safety in focusing that involvement on those items of highest risk from a criticality point of view or a novelty point of view. And I think we all agree on that. Uh, now let me just uh, illustrate uh, what we mean by this and uh, what the history of level of involvement is. So uh, I've got a simple chart here, uh, which is really just uh, showing that if we go back in time, pre aasa uh, the level of involvement of uh, authorities, certainly in the UK, um, was 100%. Everything we did in terms of reports was uh, reviewed by the national authorities as they were at the time. Over time, uh, that level of involvement has gradually decreased uh, as the authorities have got and particularly EASA now, more understanding of uh, what we do, what our methods are, um, and uh, as a result on the engine side, or at least I can speak for Rolls-Royce, on our certification programs, typically about 60% uh, of the documents are reviewed by EASA, about 40% of them aren't. So that's where we are today. Um, as the that change has happened, actually one of the things which has allowed it to happen is first of all the introduc introduction of the concept of the design organization, which we didn't used to have if you go back far enough. So now our regulator understands all our processes, systems, methods, and so they've got the confidence in those, so therefore they don't need to look at the relevant reports for every product as it comes along. And, of course, they need to continue to have that confidence, develop it further. So as the level of involvement in individual uh, oversight for specific products has gone down, the amount of audit over oversight of our design organization has gone up. And I've tried to just illustrate that uh, on the chart. So, at the moment, with the work that's going on at, at EASA, they're looking, as we've heard, to uh, perhaps standardize the approach to um, the level of involvement. 
So it's really, you know, we can be confident as industry on a new program uh, where we're likely to see involvement, where we're not. Uh, and uh, we know that from the many different uh, people and areas within EASA, we're going to get a consistent approach. So that's going to help us. And I think that will increase that or will continue that trend of uh, lower involvement from uh, EASA as time goes on. So that's all to the good. It's better use of resources. And of course, if you're focusing resources where you really need to, then that helps with safety as well, uh, because you're not uh, smearing out your resource over things that don't matter so much. But as with all good things, there's usually a, a, a couple of caveats on that. So there are two caveats to uh, the benefits of level of involvement that I'd, I'd like to touch on. And the first one is, of course, we uh, in aviation have a global industry. And uh, I thought I'd, uh, I'd illustrate that uh, global industry with a, uh, a Rolls-Royce picture. So the chart uh, that, that you can see up there uh, is illustrating the, uh, the number of Rolls-Royce uh, uh, products, uh, large civil products uh, out in service actually in 2015. And the size of the, the bubble, as you might guess, is uh, proportional to the, uh, the size of the, the, the number of products we've got in <coughs> got in that area. Um, this was 2015. I could have put up the uh, where we think we'll be in 2025. Uh, as you might expect, all the bubbles are bigger, and the one that uh, covers China is very much the uh, most bigger. I haven't put that up because, well, this isn't a marketing conference, so this is illustrating global aviation. So why is the fact that aviation is global relevant to the level of involvement of the certifying authority in uh, product certification? And the reason is, is simple. We can work really hard at this. We can get this to the optimum level. We can really improve resources. But of course, our products, after they've been certified, have to be validated by the valid validating authorities in all those countries where the products are being operated. And if that um, is extensive and has a lot of involvement, then really we're not getting any particular benefit from the certifying authorities' level of involvement. So it's important that the level of involvement of the certificating authorities um, goes along with the uh, maxim maximum uh, reliance of the validating authorities on the work of the certifying authorities through things like the BASA that uh, we were discussing this morning. So level of involvement is good, but you need the validation side uh, to be uh, worked as well. And then the second, second item about level of involvement that I think is, is really important is that we need to consider where it stops. Because you might say, OK, where's the end point? What are we aiming for? And you might follow the, the line on the previous chart and say, we're aiming for a point where the level of involvement in that detailed technical review on specific products should be zero. Now, I, from a Rolls-Royce perspective, and I know many others in, in industry agree, don't think that's actually where we should be getting to. Because we need, as industry, a level of, I say we need, a level of independent uh, oversight and overchecking is a very good way as part of our safety management systems of ensuring we have safe products. So we, and it's a part that in this industry, um, you know, we've worked up the systems with. And we don't want to go to where that's zero. So to illustrate this, um, I thought I'd bring a little bit of gloom into proceedings uh, and put up some, um, some words that have uh, uh, come from uh, a particular accident investigation, um, which was a, uh, yes, we have got it up there, which uh, was a UK-based uh, event or UK products, albeit a military one. But it's all about 
some of the findings that were related to organisational failings, uh, which could be within industry. Uh, some of them uh, might apply to, to authorities. And I think we can all read that list and say, yes, there are real pressures. There will continue to be real pressures on industry and they will grow just as, as, as we're trying to grow. So actually uh, having a, a level of overcheck is good. Now you might then say, okay, continue to have some independent overcheck, but let's do it all through the audits of the design organization. Personally, I think we need a mixture. We need the audits of the design organization and we need an appropriate level of uh, review of the real technical documents. Because after all, for a design organization, it, they become unsafe when the product is not designed right. That's how the organizational failings eventually appear uh, on, on the safety side. So to sum up, level of involvement uh, is an important uh, criteria uh, and needs to be set uh, worked at so in a way that we um, minimize the resources, optimize the resources that are needed at both the authority and in industry. Uh, it needs to be done in conjunction with uh, maximizing the reliance of the validating authority on the certific certificating authorities' uh, work um, and Overall, that should enable us to uh, you make good use of resources and uh, maintain and improve safety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we have well understood that uh, in a risk-based approach, the introduction, of course, of new technology is something which is uh, the most tricky. Uh, Mr. Didier Robin, you are head of uh, airworthiness at uh, Airbus Commercial Aircraft. Uh, Airbu at Airbus, of course, you have a, a, a lot of uh, experience in uh, uh, technology introduction. Uh, could you tell us about the, the need for collaboration between manufacturers and authorities to accelerate the introduction of new technologies? Uh, secure the, the success of those technologies, knowing that uh, most of them are introduced to improve safety. Thank you, Jack. Uh, effectively, as you said, that Airbus were used uh, at introducing uh, new technologies and uh, innovation. Uh, years ago, our motto was uh, setting the standards. Uh, in the 70s, for example, we introduced uh, Sorry, always a wrong moment, of course. Uh, in the 70s, as I was saying, uh, we uh, introduced the concept of the large twin aircraft. In the 80s, uh, we successively introduced the uh, glass cockpit and later on the digital uh, fly-by-wire uh, with a size stick that we still have uh, now. And this successive uh, generation of aircraft uh, uh, led to uh, an improvement of the safety level that I would like to introduce on a chart. You see uh, on this chart three generations of aircraft out of the four we define. The first generation are the very uh, first uh, airliners uh, where we had, we are based no product. Second generation was the more automated uh, cockpit uh, our product at the time that when we entered the, the market with the A300, generation two, the, the, the third generation is a glass cockpit and the fourth generation is fly by wear aircraft and today the fleet is essentially made of uh, Airbus aircraft by the way. And uh, you clearly see over a period of 10 years, the evolution of the safety of these uh, categories, various categories of, uh, of airplane. And the point I want to illustrate with those curves is that the level of safety, which each generation of 
technology is significantly improved, even be between the glass and the glass cockpit and the fly-by-wire uh, generation. You have today a factor two in uh, terms of uh, rate of accident per number of flights. So very important to introduce uh, technology for safety. Uh, so the innovation I just uh, mentioned, and I could mention many, many more, huh? uh, have uh, become industry standard effectively. Uh, so the question might be, have we defined the ultimate airliner of the 21st century? And should we stop there? Uh, at Airbus, we answer definitely no. We believe the pace of innovation uh, will accelerate effectively. And this is absolutely mandatory to keep on uh, improving safety for the benefit of uh, our customers and, of course, the, the public. Uh, new technologies uh, will allow improving all areas of the aircraft, uh, the cockpit, the cabin. Uh, they will allow also introducing new functions that we do not have uh, today in the airplane. Uh, and the candidates are, are, are numerous. I can uh, quote uh, new, new materials. Materials will continue to, to evolve. Uh, new manufacturing, manufacturing techniques, for example, the additive uh, layer manufacturing that is uh, uh, being introduced uh, currently in, in the industry and not only in our industry. Uh, automation for the crew, uh, connectivity, very important connectivity, uh, including for for the cabin, for, for the passengers, but also for the cockpit. And this connectivity will allow introducing new functions that will be partially uh, ground-based or in this industry, by the way, they would uh, call it cloud-based. Uh, the benefits to be expected are first safety, but also eco-efficiency and, of course, overall performance of the product and uh, convenience. What is uh, typical of innovation as far as certification is uh, concerned? Innovation and new technologies. Uh, the first characteristic is that uh, very often the certification rules for this new technology uh, does not exist or is not complete and needs to be uh, co-developed together with the technology uh, in parallel. Uh, all the more, when the existing rules in, in, in the uh, concern field are prescriptive. Uh, one example to illustrate and make things a bit more uh, uh, concrete, uh, lithium battery. Today in aviation, we have lithium battery all over the place, from the very small batteries in the equipment to the main battery uh, in, the air, uh, in the airplane. Those lithium uh, batteries have different behavior compared to the previous generation uh, cadmium uh, batteries. And they need specific rules in order to demonstrate that they are safe in the aircraft. Another example, uh, more recent, by the way, in its introduction, is uh, multi-core processors. Multi-core processors have a way of working and particular problematics, access to memory, for example, that are specific and different to single processor. Uh, so they, we need specific rules to introduce those technologies. So what are the characteristics that these new rules need to exhibit from our perspective? we are framers. Uh, as the architecture and the detailed features of those technologies uh, vary with the various uh, applicants or the various suppliers, and they also change very quickly with time, initially, uh, we of course need to have performance-based uh, rules uh, to accommodate this rate of change and variation. Uh, prescriptive rules, which is more or less or has been the rule in the, uh, or the norm in aviation, 
uh, very often assume uh, particular design or architecture and are inherently, inherently not adapted to innovation. The second requirement is that those rules uh, and the means of climate that go together must be proportionate to the safety uh, threats that is implied by the new technology. If we set standards and requirements that are too strong, we might just uh, kill a technology for aviation uh, and delay or even prevent its introduction. So we need really to have proportionality. This is the notion of risk base that Ludovic uh, developed uh, before. Uh, the third condition is that the rule needs to be developed swiftly. Why? Because if we delay the availability of the rule, we cannot introduce this new technology and we lose for this period of time the benefit of this new technology. And of course, the fourth uh, characteristic that we applicants and any framers uh, need, uh, since our industry is global, we need those rules to be harmonized worldwide. We need to certify with the same rules everywhere. Uh, and those four objectives, as you uh, already anticipate, need a very strong collaboration uh, between the industry and the airworthiness authorities. How can we therefore develop uh, these rules meeting those four criteria? for new technologies. But the first of, uh, element of answer is uh, coming by itself and is uh, en route, I would say. This is the reformulation of the basic airworthiness cause. I mean, uh, we will have very soon a new FAR 23, uh, CS 23 for general aviation that is performance based. Uh, we expect to have the same uh, happening for helicopters very soon, or uh, the next step, and then uh, the same again for uh, large aircraft, uh, CS25, uh, FAR25. This is the first element. Going from prescriptive rules, as uh, we have in the uh, existing code, to performance-based rules that will give more flexibility, and in many cases, uh, move the field of discussion to means of compliance, which is, of course, much more flexible. The second of element of answer is to use, essentially, for means of compliance, uh, industry standards. Relying on the industry standards ensures that uh, since those standards are developed by the uh, people developing the technologies, ensures that the uh, standard is adapted to the emerging technology and is uh, forcing what the technology can become as much as we can. So both of these elements of answers uh, need a strong cooperation between industry and, and uh, airworthiness uh, authorities to be fruitful. So my conclusion is that uh, regulators and uh, manufacturers need to work together in order to achieve this constant balance that is needed between ensuring the safety level that we want to keep and even improve and uh, harvesting the benefit of new technologies for uh, safety, environmental uh, protection and overall improvement of our products. Thank you. Thank you very much. On my side, I have failed to introduce new technologies and <laughs> with a huge reset <laughs> of this tablet. So I think that we are going to uh, uh, make a traditional uh, way uh, for the question, and I will ask uh, the people uh, in the room if they have questions to our panelists to raise the hand, and we will uh, give them a microphone. <laughs> uh, 
Eric Parlon from uh, Thales. Uh, it's more a comment, a uh, complimentary comment. Uh, about one side, you explained that uh, with the LOI, level of involvement, will optimize the resources. In the second side, industry explained that we need a strong cooperation between uh, industry and authority to introduce new technology. What I think is that is a message for authority and that you, you have taken already into account is that the resource that you gain in the, in the, to, to have a smaller involvement in a certification project should be really set upstream in the upstream development of the product to help and to cooperate with industry to develop and to be mature to introduce this new technology is really key and is the culture change in authority, I think. And on the industry side, I think we are all agree that we need that and uh, to work with you and that authority will get maybe more availability to work with us and to, to improve the safety collectively. Thank you. Some, some comment to that, uh, to that statement. I, <laughs> Not really a question, but a statement. <laughs> if I may comment a comment, thank you, first of all. Um, um, I will speak, of course, on behalf of EASA, but CAC might have also some comments on that. Uh, I think that uh, you, you're, you're totally right. Uh, this is the idea, uh, in any case. And um, we are facing rapid pace of technology advancements, and uh, the authority needs to um, keep up with, this, uh, in, with the industry uh, progress. Uh, through a proactive engagement, you're right. And for that, uh, we are already um, in the process of uh, moving towards uh, uh, um, a phase, uh, a cooperation with the industry that is in three phases. We are no longer focused only on certification. Certification is already too late to keep up with the technology uh, advancement. So the three phases, the three main phases are uh, being involved in research. Uh, that is uh, something really essential that enables early detection of new technologies uh, and novel features. Um, and uh, this is done through the elaboration of research program, being involved in the elaboration of research programs, selection and uh, prioritizing uh, the research um, programs using risk-based criteria as well. Uh, and uh, the second phase is a proof of concept phase, uh, whereby uh, we have already uh, um, a mechanism in place at EASA with uh, technical advice contract. And, uh, and many of uh, our industry uh, friends uh, today in the room uh, knows well about it because they are using it. Uh, I hope they see the benefit for it because it enables us in cooperation and partnerships to uh, provide advice, but at the same time uh, start developing our own rules uh, when we are facing uh, new technologies and innovation. Uh, and the third phase is obviously certification, as we mentioned before, uh, which is really compliance checking and compliance demonstration. But accounting or taking into account new technology only during phase three, which is certification, is definitely too late. And that's why we are having this now implementing this more proactive approach to new technologies. But, but really, uh, w what I can say on my side is that, for example, uh, for the certification of the composite fan blade of the LIP, we have managed with uh, with EASA uh, to work, to begin to work, I would say, 10 years ago, uh, before certification, to define really what, uh, what were the rules to, to be applied, uh, what were the preliminary testing to, to be done. What has to be done at sample level, at component level, at engine level. And I think we, we have discovered together the, the issue and uh, solve, solve, solve it and, and go to certification. Of course, it has taken at least 10 years. So.
A second question, please. It's coming in your back. <laughs> oh, sorry, again, question. I'm a little bit surprised that uh, this should be about the future way of uh, certification and something. And nobody of you mentioned that uh, based on the safety data, the certification is not a significant factor in the accidents, etc. Therefore, from my point of view, why we are spending so much time and effort on certification and not on the other things which have the contribution to the safety? Just uh, one word. I, I believe Belinda touched on it. Certification is effectively, uh, you are right, or I, uh, I say very often uh, in house, it's just the last step of verification in the development, uh, classically called a V shape of development. Uh, Airframers or system suppliers need to uh, develop and then verify their product. Certification is a formalization that the verification is complete. So you would not need, theoretically, any involvement of any external body. Uh, but I share the uh, point of Belinda, is that if effectively there was no external involvement, uh, the system would be unstable. And uh, little by little, whatever effort and uh, design assurance system we put in place in house, there would be a tendency uh, to have deviations of the way we monitor our design and verify our design, and there would be nobody to tell us, uh, you get used to your deviation, this is the, what is specific with the deviation, you get used to your deviation and you do not see them anymore. So with an external body, and this is a certification agency, uh, we have assurance that uh, an external uh, eye he comparing, by the way, different applicants, so therefore having a wider view, can uh, monitor that our verification is effectively complete. As there is, you know, in safety, the problem is that accidents come from a hole in the uh, in uh, in, uh, in the net, and not uh, very often by not by. Uh, an overall decrease of uh, the verification, but just a whole. And to see that, we, we better have an external view. Belinda? So just to uh, uh, agree with that point uh, uh, and maybe add to it, I, I think the um, accidents uh, uh, and incidents, um, there's nothing there that says certification isn't important. In fact, I would say it says certification is very important and we're doing it well, and it's really important that we continue to do it well and safely and put the effort and, where needed, oversight into it. Some other question? We have time for, for another question. Uh, Didier, uh, I was interested in one of your slides. I don't know if it can be put up, uh, the one with the um, accident rates. I was having only one slide, so it will be easy to keep to find it back. Um, so while they're finding it, uh, you had different generations of aircraft with the accident rates um, over time. And, uh, you know, sometimes we come across a thing called a bathtub curve where the level reduces, goes low, and then it increases. Two of your lines um, seem to be at each end of the bathtub curve because um, the orange line is increasing, the older aircraft, and the um, future generation has reduced to a low level and it seems flat. Do you think um, these are bathtub curves and we're looking at each end, or 
do you think that it's just reduced and will stay low? So the new generation, if we look forwards 20 years, do you think it will increase with uh, different uses, uh, wear out of the aircraft and, and so on? So you see that the top curve, the orange curve that is climbing, uh, s s finishes by, by being uh, dashed because, in fact, these generations are less and less airplanes in this category, and therefore the statistics are less and less pertinent. That's why it uh, is dashed in the end. Uh, you understand that this second generation, and even more the first generation that is not at all on my chart, uh, is not operated by the same kind of operators as second and third generation. We are talking very old airplanes. So there might be other factors explaining why this curve is, uh, is climbing. For the fourth generation, if, we, if your question is in 30, 40 years from now, and we do not think what, what will this generation become, might be that again there is a shift of this generation of airplane to say a different category of uh, operators and that there are also risk factors coming in possibly, uh, we'll see that uh, in 50 years. Uh, an important comment you are making is that the curve tend to be flat and of course for the industry this is something significant uh, in order to gain, so therefore, we need to launch uh, something new in order to, for example, divide again the uh, accident rate by a factor two, for example, or three, whatever. But we need to set to ourselves uh, a new ambition. And the point is that, uh, of this chart, is that uh, technology might be, or is probably, the way we have uh, to gain on the significantly on, on the accident rate. This is not having better, more stringent uh, certification rules that will improve this curve, we believe, but introduction of more automation, uh, for example, or, or uh, um, new features on the airplane uh, to improve the accident rate. There are other factors than technology in safety. Uh, we are talking certification in this panel. There are, of course, other factors. Training uh, is uh, another uh, aspect that we uh, insist upon. By the way, uh, Fabrice uh, mentioned this morning uh, training and education as uh, a very important factor for, for safety. Not only crews, uh, uh, mechanics, uh, all the chain of uh, people uh, operating the airplane, potentially also designing airplanes. So these are the factors that should help us effectively having a fifth generation, hopefully, in some years, having being below the, uh, the X axis and the yellow curve. There was another question, I think. I'm with CAC doing auditing and certificating. I have a question about DOA and DS. Uh, from your talk uh, uh, with the COMAC, uh, DS system in your company is evolving and improving in your company since the establishment, and you also benefit a lot. Uh, and also you mentioned um, it's the collaboration and demand uh, of authorities and the company. And uh, from Rolls-Royce, uh, the madam, you mentioned your practice uh, about YASA uh, introducing DOA system so that uh, YASA um, involves into um, the uh, system from 100 to 60%. Uh, so my question is to uh, Yasa, 
when you were introducing in DOA system, is it because of uh, uh, matured practice in your manufacturing industry? My second question is to Zhu Xuefeng. Uh, with the improvement of our cap capability, m whether there will be a DOA system introduced in CAAC uh, industry in order to improve this uh, validation uh, efficiency. Well, uh, the, um, the question is uh, how uh, we created the conditions to increase uh, this reliance on the design organizations and for, first of all uh, the, the the as i mentioned it's uh, the conditions were there from the beginning in our system um, we decided from the beginning that we would have a combined uh, level of oversight of organization and uh, uh, involvement in the product certification and this these conditions are created by our regulations, so the legal framework. But then there was a learning curve, as you mentioned. Uh, we did not implement that from day one at uh, the same level for each uh, applicant. Uh, it's um, a continuing learning process uh, where uh, there is uh, an, an oversight of the organization and uh, a system where an applicant, uh, a design organization, can apply for new privileges, and he's audited. Uh, there are surveillance audits, uh, desk reviews that are put in place so as to, at each step, ensure that this uh, learning is uh, on track and that we can extend more uh, the privilege of a design organization. So definitely it takes time to create the condition of a confidence building between uh, uh, the uh, industry uh, partner and the uh, authority. Um, and uh, it requires definitely a system where uh, you have honesty, uh, openness from, from the industry partner. Uh, that is opening completely, is uh, developing and opening his uh, safety assurance system to, to the authority for complete check. I let maybe. About DOA system, I would say that uh, it's different from a traditional system uh, for a particular individual product. It, um, there would be auditing or validation for the company itself, the whole organization, beside uh, the product itself, so that uh, uh, the overall capability of the applicants could be uh, viewed. Um, in 2007, uh, CCR um, had its third revision. Uh, we started to consider the system, and then after that, in the next edition, uh, we clarified, uh, and then we started to uh, use the uh, DOS system of YASA. We are going through the third revision, the now, so we bring brought in DAS. So the DAS uh, requirements are now in and taken on board, and of course uh, there will be more mandate. Which, uh, uh, as you heard just now, level of involvement or the uh, oversight, I think uh, it's uh, pr pretty similar. Level of involvement we also have, but we uh, need tools or guiding documents or materials to standardize the this part of the work. So through DOA, it's an excellent tool for us uh, to standardize the work. Perhaps it would be able to do a better job. CAC 
has already approved uh, of the the work. I, I am hoping that the first half of this year there will be approval, the final go ahead signal. Thank you. So, perhaps to, to finish the panel, uh, right at the beginning, uh, there, was, there was some question which was raised. Uh, what do you think uh, will, in the future, impact more heavily the way we are managing our worthiness? There was some proposal, public expectation, especially environment uh, uh, expectation, the size of the fleet, the cybersecurity, globalization, unmanned vehicles and drones. Can, can you say, according to you, what, uh, what could uh, lead to, to, some, uh, to the most important change uh, in the way of managing airworthiness? Belinda, you have a you have a proposal. I, I think it's an impossible question, but uh, I'll I'll start by uh, saying I think the public expectation is extremely important because it is things like environment, but it's also about safety. So the public expects to get on an airplane and get off the other end, and nothing that is in any way unsafe to happen uh, in between. Um, and of course that goes hand in hand as the fleet grows, that just to achieve today's level of safety, uh, we've got to do better. So you put those things together and we have to react in a really good way to, um, to manage uh, and change and keep the fleet safe. Some of the other things are specific areas, drones, for example, but I'll let others uh, disagree with me. <laughs> I believe the first two go together, the uh, public expectation and the uh, the fleet, because the fleet is growing. So if the accident rate is staying the same, number of accidents uh, will double over 15 years, whereas the public expectation is rather that uh, it's zero. So there will be there is a contradiction between what the public is expecting and what we would do. That's why we need to find ways to improve unit safety, if I may say, or number of accidents per number of departure, uh, in order to, at least to compensate for the fleet growth. But I would vote for the last one, which are the drones, effectively, Belinda, uh, because drones, or these kind of vehicles, by the way, there is a large uh, variability of what of the usages, the op kind of operations that uh, will be uh, endeavored by those drones. The size will vary uh, a lot. And the uh, companies uh, proposing these products very often are not from uh, the aeronautical, the aviation world. They have a different culture. They have a culture that is very often uh, focused on going very quick and experimenting very quickly, which is kind of uh, different of what we are doing. We have a very, very safe approach, very conservative approach. They, are, they have a very, uh, they are much less risk adverse, but not uh, perhaps focused on safety as we are. So there is a shock of cultures to be expected uh, in this field. and. Also, of course, the need for the rules to come very, very quickly, as I was mentioning before, uh, to address uh, not only the design of uh, and certification of these uh, vehicles, but also the operational rules, which will be uh, essential, at least for the medium or small drones, to be able to operate them uh, safely. Let me put it this way, the fleet size 
indeed is a challenge for for an organization. But when it comes to a, a design organization assurance, well, we have to we have to look at the results for the certification. Uh, that would not do the trick. We need to guarantee the process is safe. But what tools do we adopt? What sort of processes? Uh, we at Comac are still learning. But I agree with um, my other colleagues that the processes uh, are important. Back to the uh, fleet size. Indeed, uh, the fleet keeps uh, growing. So the numbers would bring uh, the critical mass. Uh, so for the in terms of the tools, the approaches, the human resources, uh, it, it cannot grow indefinitely. So that would constitute a challenge for the organization, how the public would look at uh, the uh, manufacturers uh, in terms of uh, monitoring safety. For OEM, for manufacturers, the growing fleet size and uh, the airworthiness of our aircraft, we need to find better ways. The processes have to be there to guarantee. Processes as guarantee is one of them. Do we have a better way or any better approaches? I suppose uh, colleagues in the industry will have to conduct more research and uh, will have to learn more. That, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sayer, I think that uh, actually your question is more political than it looks um, because actually it all depends on the political context. Uh, I would be happy to say that the, the most uh, important changes will come from uh, environmental awareness if I was uh, an optimistic person. Um, if there was a political will to develop uh, more in that direction. Um, if the political context is going in more uh, towards liberal, liberalism, then I would say that the permanent look for increased profitability will definitely drive the most important changes as it is today with um, the look for, for instance, maybe single pilot operations on commercial large transport airplanes. Uh, the uh, flexible cabin arrangements so as to adapt permanently the number of economic business seats uh, to each flight or um, new innovation in the same uh, of the same type of as additive manufacturing and uh, I would also look into of course uh, revolution in mobility uh, which encompasses, of course, drones, but also air taxi, uh, possibly low boom supersonic uh, transport uh, for passengers. Um, this is the three main points that I see. I suppose uh, the expe public expectation, when it comes to public expectations, I think that's a one uh, important aspect for us to take on board, take into consideration. I agree with my uh, colleagues that uh, unmanned pile uh, aircraft, that would be uh, quite uh, something there. The technology has been developing very fast. Uh, it has been reported that 70% uh, uh, of the drones will be developed. We, we can, we, we do see that you look at the manned aircrafts, uh, the development of uh, drones or technology, that would bring about some new area. For example, express delivery. They can use uh, drones to, uh, to uh, uh, transport uh, parcels and goods. And I suppose that the concept would bring about changes as well. Look at uh, traditional or conventional kind of uh, uh, validation. It may not be 
that closely linked. But when it comes to managing drones, how would it be operated? What sort of uh, is it for pe for transporting people or transporting uh, cargoes? That would bring about uh, challenges for validation. And one other thing, because it has so much to do with the uh, ground operations, I suppose uh, these aspects would become more and more important. So in terms of certification, I suppose there would be cha changes. That's my view. Thank you. Uh, what I understand is that perhaps we don't know exactly uh, what will happen to the, tomorrow. But uh, what I'm sure is that uh, what we will have to do, we will have to, to do with certainly a huge reactivity because uh, things are going very fast. And we will have also to do it through cooperation, cooperation between manufacturers to progress on some tricky uh, safety issues. Some years ago, it was titanium survey and elaboration. And certainly, uh, force is not the end for, for the risk committee, and we will have more subjects. Uh, to work together. Uh, cooperation between authorities uh, to be able to propose, of course, regulation, harmonization, and regulation update. Cooperation between, of course, authorities and manufacturers to define new way for certification of new technologies because we see that new technologies are bringing safety and we need to introduce them very, very rapidly. I think that cooperation could be the, the master word and the conclusion for, for this panel 1A. I want, of course, to thank uh, CAEC and IASA to have organized this, this conference. And from time to time, it's very important to stop and sometimes to uh, think about how we can improve our job. And I think that uh, the exchange has been very, very interesting. Of course, uh, I want to, to thank the, the panelists of Panel 1A who have worked a lot uh, to prepare that, uh, that session. I am very proud to have been the moderator of this, of this panel. Thank you. Thank